So for all the internet trolls out there who are always writing comments in my videos like, man, this guy talks way too much and blah, 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 just shut up and play your guitar. Today is the day when I explain why I don't give a fat rat's ass about what any of y'all say. So this video is an introduction to what I call grid-based creativity. And in the simplest way, this can be described as anything in music that can be described objectively and then subjected to various logical or mathematical systematic processes. And one of the problems with this approach that the public has is that they, they perceive it as being the enemy of emotion, which is what I think is the opposite of the truth. Um, though you, you can try to use music theory as a way to try to pimp your, uh, intellectual credentials. Really, in my opinion, this is more of an approach to what John Mayer would maybe describe as heavier things. William Alauddin Matthew often quotes a Sufi mystic and says that the mind is the willing slave of the heart. And in my opinion, I've gone through different phases where I've been more intellectually focused or more emotionally focused with my music. But at the end of the day, I really think the best balance or the best experience comes from when the two things are kind of working together nicely. But even that kind of makes music seem like a simplified, just sort of yin-yang balancing act, when in fact, uh, using this idea of grids is a way to all kinds of different musical emotions. When I say grid-based creativity, I mean, that's really the key is that this is a creative process. This is not like, you know, some kind of mind control thing or some kind of repetitious mathematical exercise. And the emotions that these grids lead to in people range from everything like what someone experiences climbing Mount Everest to what someone experiences when they're tinkering in a shop to invent a better mousetrap or the spiritual ecstasy of discovering a divine language. You know, all these kind of emotions come from exploring grid-based activities in musical creativity. And one of the key ideas that's going to go along with these grids is this idea of making sorts of maps. You can make a grid or a map out of almost any idea in music, and then you can systematically transform it or toy with it in a way to try to find new things or to, in a way to put your own stamp on it. So you can really kind of put your own meaning on these abstract ideas, but you have to kind of be able to systematize them first. But once you can do that, the things that you can do to them and the things that they can do to you are a lot more than what most people would expect. And that's why I think exploring this series is going to be fun. One more quick note before I go any further. A lot of people think of music theory as a series of rules, and this is really only true if your teacher is making you follow them. In reality, music theory can be a lot of different things. It can be a path that's been created by a lot of different masters in an old tradition. It can be a way of discovering unexplored country or finding a sort of intellectual untamed wilderness. And even to other people, it's just a way of getting building blocks that you can use to create your own kind of Minecraft cathedral, just whatever you can imagine. And to even other people, it's a way of kind of discovering these infallible laws of the universe, these deeper principles that guide uh, musical language as a universal language. And so it can be a lot of different things to different people. But this basic idea of understanding what grids are and how they work is really key. So we're going to start with some historical examples of grids in different cultures. So you can kind of get the picture of what's out there. One real quick definition, I would say, anything that you can describe as a grid has to be subject to this principle of possibilities you can exhaust. You have to set a set of parameters on a set of objects where you can, quote, exhaust the possibilities. And this is a really important idea that we're going to see in every grid process that we work with. And my first source of grid-based creativity that I studied was the Well-Tempered Clavier. It's a series of compositions by Johann Sebastian Bach. And the basic idea is that back in Bach's era, uh, they had invented a system where there were 12 keys or more, but it, the, the innovations in tuning theory to allow you to play in all those keys equally did not yet exist. I mean, basically what you would get is on a keyboard, you could usually play in five to eight keys and they'd sound okay, and the rest of the keys would sound like a bad accident at the sawmill. But then Bach had invented in his own way a system of what's called a circulating temperament uh, or a tuning system where you could actually play in all the conceivable keys on the keyboard and they would sound at least okay. And so what Bach did as soon as he invented this was he took some musical forms with which, which he was familiar. He took instrumental preludes and fugues and then he applied them systematically to all 12 major and minor keys that were in the music system he did. And this generates 48 pieces that were, are all very unique in character, partially because the tuning of each key at that time was slightly 
slightly different and gave a little bit of a different mood off, but also because, you know, the fingering suggests different feelings and it, the, the musical forms inspire different things. So what he did was use this system as a way of inspiring slightly different things that are all satisfying, but not having to reinvent the wheel with every composition. And he liked this process so much that he did it again. He wrote two well-tempered clavier books, 48 pieces each, and these are still very well loved by, you know, current generations of classical musicians. So this is a great system for systematic creativity. Another example really goes back to very, very early tuning theory. Of course, the most simple kind of grid there is really is a scale. And people have been inventing scales and systematizing them since as far back as they've known anything about mathematics. But if you look at the Greek tuning theory systems, uh, Pythagoreans especially believed that numbers held the secrets to the universe and their entire religion was based on the idea of studying numbers. Very much of that was done through music. So you can actually use the systems of Pythagorean tunings to trace the, the sort of genetic ideas of Greek tuning systems because there was a time during sort of the dark ages in Europe where a lot of the texts were lost and though European music theorists were looking back to Greek texts for their ideas. They actually didn't have very accurate sources or they misinterpreted a lot of them. Uh, but whereas in the Arabic world, they actually did have accurate Greek sources and scholars such as Al-Farabi actually could use Greek sources to derive Greek scales, which are the sources of many modern Arabic tuning systems. And so another thing you can see you can do with grids is start to understand if you look at like scale grids, you can use them to kind of trace the sources of different styles of music. And you can also start to trace the sources of different musical creative processes. What George Lewis described as sort of urological musical thinking really kind of came with the split between how Greek scales made their way into Gregorian chant versus Arabic makam, both of which are melodic systems, which are hypothetically based on Greek ideas. But as uh, Gregorian chant eventually evolved, evolved into contrapuntal methods, uh, Arabic makam stayed more as a complex system of melody and melodic development. And that really kind of marks a very strong difference between how the musical systems are created and where their creativity lies. But this idea even of gene matching is just kind of a fun thing to do because you can also find quarter tones in Russian Orthodox chants, whereas you can't in Western Catholic chants. So a lot of these uh, European influenced genres of music that have quarter tones in them can actually have their roots traced back to Greek music. So aside from these kind of interesting musicological applications, you can use scales themselves as a creative process. And in, in fact, throughout, out of all of tuning history, this has been done, where often a tuning theorist will sort of invent a scale or an idea, and then practitioners will kind of take it and mess with it, not necessarily knowing a lot of the theory, but using it to create all kinds of new things. And this is still true in the Arabic world. A lot of Arabic musicians can't really tell you anything about the mathematics of tuning theory, but they do know a lot of creative ways to change the tunings of notes or to change the way that melodies work with different tuning systems to create these really, really great styles of music. But if you want to talk about the grid-based aspects of music theory, you can draw different kinds of boundaries to create your exhaustive possibilities. You can either look at sort of the perceptual limits of you know how much people like a certain set of notes, you know, when you have a smaller set of notes, it's usually simpler for people to understand. And you can eventually start to push yourself to a point where you say, there's too many notes in this system. It's too complex. It gets too far from the generating tone. It's not really a viable tonal melodic system. So you can exhaust the possibilities in that way. And then even within that, you can take smaller groups of notes and say, well, you know, what if we use, you know, these notes, let's say we use minor thirds and major thirds, but no quarter tones. Or, okay. Let's say, let's allow ourselves to add quarter tones. What combinations of scales can you create? What hard harmonic properties they ha do they have, what melodic properties do they have. You can do an incredible amount of changing a musical and melodic system just by screwing with what notes you make available to yourself. And tuning history has shown this time and time again. Another form of grid-based creativity showed up in Europe in the second Viennese school, which was uh, Arnold Schoenberg, uh, Anton Webern, and Alban Berg. Now, Schoenberg and Webern had some very interesting techniques that they used for 12-tone composition. That they, they used to just kind of expand their compositional possibilities. Webern used a technique I find very interesting called, I call checklisting, where he would literally say to himself, all right, here's all the notes, and he would just, you know, write them in a melody and just kind of check them off 
as he used them, so he made sure he didn't repeat himself. And he used this technique in a couple of different ways. And you'll find even today, when hip hop artists do certain types of freestyle improvisations, they'll have the similar checklisting technique, where they have a list of words they want to use. And just to prove they're improvising, they write down the list of words. And every time they use it, they kind of check it off. I've seen this in freestyle compositions. So this checklisting technique is, in a way, a grid as well that can be used for different compositional and improvisational processes. Of course, then when you look to Schoenberg, I mean, Schoenberg was an incredibly prolific and intellectual composer. He had studied virtually everything in European history of music that came before him. So he understood counterpoint, he understood canons, um, he understood this concept of exhausting the possibilities extremely well. And when he got into 12-tone composition, you know, he really got into um, different ways of combining tone rows and of, of using every single note in the Western musical system that he had, equal temperament, to create all different kinds of sounds with these 12-tone compositions. And that has further given rise to the use of atonal matrices, which is a very, very interesting and you know, variegated form of composition today. It's, it's a little bit more intellectual fringe stuff, but I mean, in terms of the possibilities and the sounds that it can create and the uniqueness of them through explicitly mathematical methods, it's very, very interesting if you'll ever want to get into it. Now, even going back to Bach and his kind of antecedents like Brahms and Beethoven, this idea of canons, um, the idea of writing a melody that harmonizes itself nicely at different time and musical interval intervals. If you combine different systems of, okay, let's write a canon and then start it again, you know, a half a bar later, or let's take this canon and start a half a bar later, but it's a fifth higher than it was when it started. This is a very simple grid-based system that you can use to study melodic properties and create all kinds of interesting contrapuntal systems. This is another very common thing in European history. If we go to something entirely different and we look at Indian classical music, you know, they have, in a way, a variety of grid systems based on kind of combining melodies with improvisational processes. You could take a raga, which has its own kind of internal grid-based melodic properties, but then also subject those melodic formulas to performance processes, systematic performance processes. You have a basic idea in Drupad, which is an older style of Indian classical music, where you take a raga and you go through three phases, alap, jor, and jala. And one of them is a very kind of slow process with no meter. And then you kind of add a pulse, but it's kind of slow and do a bunch of things to the melodies. And then you make it faster and do all those same things again. But this is sort of a uh, an improvisational process where you say, you take this melody, and at this point you do this to it. At this point you do this to it. At this point you do this to it. And you can do that, you know, an unlimited amount. And this is a lot of what they study in Indian classical music, is taking rhythmic and melodic vocabulary and screwing with it all kinds of different ways, but in all kinds of systematic processes to fit it to different audiences and different expressive intents. And it, it is in a way a grid, although it's not explicitly like a scale or a rhythm. It's more of an improvisational structure or a performance structure in a way. Now, more recently, people have gotten interested in this idea of rhythmic grids. The drummer Gavin Harrison is very well known for his work in systematic rhythmic transformations. Uh, he has these books he calls Rhythmic Illusions, which are in essentially a way of talking about rhythmic modulations, but he'll talk about, you know, just basic grids of saying, okay, once you have even a meter, a meter is a very simple grid in, in the same way as a scale is a grid. But then asking yourself, okay, now that you've got this rhythmic grid, what can you do with it? You know, percussionists will talk about gridding drum rudiments, take the flam, and now, okay, try to put that flam on every single beat of a bar of 4-4. Four, four. Okay, how about every single beat of a bar of 7-8? How about uh, putting a couple of different types of rhythmic feet or a combination of a couple of rhythmic rudiments in different places? It's a very challenging exercise when you start to get into the complexity of it. And then when you start to do things like taking different elements of a rhythmic cycle of like a drum groove or something like that and saying, all right, let's take the hi-hat and phase shift it against what the bass drum is doing, or the bass drum and phase shift it, or phase shift two things at a time. You start to get a large number of combinatoric possibilities, which you can use for a lot of different creative purposes. And you have to be a little bit careful because you can get into possibilities which are very hard to perform, very difficult to kind of produce in ways, and not all of them sound equally good, but you can use this as a way to develop new ideas. This is what Gavin Harrison does, is he says, here's a transformational process for rhythm, why don't you screw with it in all these ways? And when you find an idea you like within it, keep that, throw out the rest. But it's a really good way to generate new ideas that wouldn't have been thought of otherwise. Now, you can also get into very specific transformations of melodies. If you look at 
Gregorian chant and uh, Indian melodies, ragas, or really any kind of melodic formula throughout the world, makam, any type of Chinese melody, any of these sorts of things, you can start to look at the scale structure, but then how certain intervallic or melodic ideas are related to the different scale degrees that you have. These are the ideas of melodic formulas or melody types. You can study those a lot, and that's really the, kind of the soul of every folk culture, is unconsciously a use of those grid ideas. The ear kind of unconsciously picks those ideas up. And even people who have no training in music theory will often know how to move an, a melody around or transpose it within a scale. You know, j just because it's just, the ear just knows how to do it. But then you can also go in with music theory and intentionally screw with this stuff as a way of inventing new things or understanding musical systems that are already there. It's an incredibly powerful way to generate very accessible music ideas that haven't been generated before. And then there's the composer William Alaudin Matthew. He's got this great book called Harmonic Experience, where he really gets into these ideas of taking harmony and melody and really getting into the guts of transforming them mathematically, starting with a scale, building a system from the ground up, but how you use inventive processes with melodies and with harmony, and then the two together using modulations. He has an incredible array of techniques for systematically exploring melody and harmony for, for, on every single level. And there are a lot of other modern composers who have different techniques of approaching these things, but the, the, the variety is ridiculous. And I think anyone who says, okay, we've played out tonality or we've played out harmony and hasn't looked at those works, you know, hasn't realized, wow, the, the potential for what we can do with even these old ideas is, is we barely even scratched the surface. So a real quick summary of some of the grids that we've looked at through that historical summary, we've talked about just this idea of scales. A scale is a grid. Um, a meter or a rhythmic cycle or a tala, transforming those through rhythmic motives or shifting phase shifting rhythms or phase shifting melodies through different parts of those grids. That's a technique that you can use for creative purposes and also for kind of structural analytical purposes. Any kind of transpositional system where you take a melody or a harmony or a piece and you move it to other keys, that's a creative process. You can use that both on instruments and if you use like open guitar tunings, trying to find a way to just change the grid of a guitar tuning, letting your finger do whatever they might do in this new tuning. That's a grid-based technique. Using things like atonal combinatorics or using intervallic theory within a tonal system, those are grid-based techniques. Any kind of contrapuntal technique that you use, whether it's like inverting a melody or using canons, any type of melodic transformation you do in a contrapuntal system, that's a grid. These checklisting techniques where you say, all right, here's all the possibilities of things I want to screw with, or here's a bunch of elements that I want to use in some order, and you just kind of check them off, that's a grid-based technique. And the key with each of these ideas is you can set a set of limits and exhaust a set of possibilities of what are essentially explorations of the system. And you can design these and get better at designing them as a way of stimulating your thinking so that you never ever get stuck or so you can figure out, okay, what has been done already and what hasn't and how do I go somewhere that people have never gone before? So as I explore this idea more in later videos, I'm going to try to go a little bit more into the specific applications of these things, like how you see songwriters who don't understand grids kind of recycling the same as one reason songwriters always write things that sound the same is because they don't understand how to break out of what they know. Another way of using grids we're going to talk about is a technique for mnemonics, memorizing the elements of the musical system based on a grid of what's in them or what's normal in them. And then there are like really specific creative techniques that you can use to kind of evolutionize or revolutionize a system that you have first by kind of drawing what the system is or what the musical language is and then figuring out what it's not or what it could be. In general, for me, the key idea with this is that you may start exploring grids just out of an intellectual curiosity, and in a way they're kind of prophylactic in terms of like running out of ideas in the future. It's kind of like just in case knowledge rather than just in time knowledge. But in a lot of ways, what starts as an intellectual curiosity often leads to a real kind of explorer ethic, a real kind of pathfinder. It's like exploring these epic systems kind of gives you a sense of awe. And this idea of exploring how numbers can give you a real insight into aesthetics and beauty and communication. It has a really kind of powerful, really kind of sobering emotion, which I, I, a lot of times I would describe it as awe. It's kind of an amazing feeling to explore the epicness of what you run into when you start to look at music this way. And even if you're 
only concern is just to sound a little bit different or to just not repeat what's been done in the past again and again and again. Knowing just enough music theory, even just to build these grids and just get yourself a little outside of what everyone else is doing, you know, that has a lot of merit to it too. And a lot of people who get stuck, I find, are people who have written off the use of grid-based music theory techniques as a as a creative device, and mostly because people have imposed it as rules on top of that. It's really not what it is. We'll get more into that in later videos, but I just kind of want to drop those as thoughts on you for the time being, and yeah, we'll, we'll see what it leads to in the future. Thanks for sticking with us this long. I'll see you in the next video.